Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for July 16th, 2021. As Ronald Reagan used to say about his detractors, there they go again. Uh, not surprisingly, we have a new fraud coming from British intelligence directed at the question of the 2016 election. This appeared in yesterday's Guardian, which has run a whole series of these articles. In fact, uh, the lead author of this article is Luke Harding, who wrote a book called Collusion, which was a complete and total defense of MI6 operative Christopher Steele and his Trump PP dossier, which even the FBI was forced to admit was fraudulent, was, was a concoction. The chief uh, witness that, that Steele used admitted he made it all up. And yet here they are once again going back to the same well, the same story that the American people were hoodwinked by an operation run by Russian President Putin, which put what they call the very unstable Donald Trump in the White House. Now here's what the story says. It's an exclusive story and it claims that someone in the Kremlin leaked top secret documents which suggest that President Putin personally signed a decree surrounded by all of his top intelligence operatives to get Trump elected because they believed this would unleash social turmoil in the United States. The article goes on to say that the Western intelligence agencies have carefully examined the documents and they, quote, appear to be genuine. Uh, the Guardian says this is more evidence of Putin's role in placing the mentally unstable Trump in the White House. Well, you know, how often do you go to the same well, uh, especially after you discover the water is poisoned? Uh, Luke Harding has been completely demolished as a source. Uh, Aaron Maté exposed him. Uh, as one who said that the reason he's credible, and this is what Harding said, he's credible because he once lived in Russia. But Christopher Steele also lived in Russia, and he was not credible. The story was not credible. And this latest one doesn't hold up. Uh, the former British ambassador, Sir Andrew Wood, who was one of the key people in promoting the original Steele dossier, and who may have been the one who passed it on to someone who truly was mentally unstable, John McCain, uh, would describe the documents as spellbinding. Now, in response to this, the Kremlin spokesman Peskov described it as more pulp fiction, whereas Trump spokeswoman Liz Harrington said, this is disgusting fake news. Just like Russia, Russia, Russia was fake, fake news. It's fiction. Now the question is, why is this coming out now? The whole Russiagate story has been thoroughly discredited, and yet it's still presented as though it's real by people such as Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Rachel Maddow, the mainstream media, the anti-Trump media, the anti-Putin media, but why is it coming out now? Well, there was a summit that took place between Biden and Putin, and there were certain positive elements that came out of that summit, which pointed toward the possibility of putting an end to the Russia, Russia, Russia story. Now, it hasn't done that definitively. There's still this whole narrative of, of Russian cyber warfare, that Putin is still out to get the United States and, and so on. And there's also still the story that Trump was not really elected, that it was a fraudulent election. Uh, the Hillary Clinton networks never want to acknowledge that they lost the election because she was such a terrible candidate. But there's another story here, which is that the real issue in the 2016 election was the rejection of the neocons and the neoliberals who were for permanent warfare, permanent austerity, and permanent bailouts. They were terrified that if Trump worked with the Russians, it would put an end to the geopolitical doctrine which characterized the British control over the United States foreign policy establishment. Now, this is the, to take up the question that I received repeatedly this week in your questions. A number of you asked, why do you and, and the LaRouche organization speak so much 
about geopolitics. Isn't geopolitics just a banal idea? Well, the way the media talks about geopolitics is as though any strategic discussion is geopolitics. But we're using an actual specific historical concept which was presented in 1904 by Sir Halford Mackinder in his Geographical Pivot of History, his lecture to the uh, Royal Geographical Society, in which he put forward a strategic conception of how the British Empire can maintain its dominance at a moment when the American system of economics was taking over the world, not through military force, but because of the brilliance of its approach. That is that in Germany, in France, in Russia, in Japan, uh, around the world, the, the view of American development, of prosperity, of freedom, that grew out of the victory in the Civil War and the economic policies of Lincoln, which included uh, protectionism rather than free trade, which included national banking rather than free market uh, uh, speculation. The American system demonstrated its capability to build a strong economy and it was being adopted by other countries around the world. This, especially the railroad aspect of it, was a threat to British domination of international trade and finance, which depended on the Royal Navy. And so what Mackinder argued is that the gravest threat to the British Empire, which he said was the threat to democracy and freedom, and by the way, the British Empire is not an example of democracy and freedom. Just ask the people of Ireland, ask the people of India, ask the American founding fathers if they found the British Empire to be democratic and free. Of course not. But what Mackinder argued is the greatest threat would be an alliance between nations of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and Eurasia, which was coming into existence with the transcontinental rail idea that came from the United States. And so they had to deploy their forces to do whatever was possible to prevent that from occurring. This is the same outlook that was embedded in the great game in the middle of the 19th century, which led to Afghanistan as a crossroads of constant inter-imperial rivalry, which maybe we're finally finished with. That gets to the point of why again target Russia. The Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Iranians, the Pakistanis, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and others are now talking about how to extricate the, the situation in, Iran, in Afghanistan from war and through mutual cooperation, rebuild the nation, create a livable modern society, not by just pouring money in. The United States poured in trillions of dollars. What did we get? Dead American soldiers, large numbers of, of dead Afghans, and a country where half the population lives in extreme poverty and we were there for 20 years. No, the idea is to extend the Belt and Road Initiative with cooperation from other countries, including hopefully the United States and Europe, to engage in an actual rebuilding program, which is not just pouring money in, but providing modern transportation, modern infrastructure, telecommunications, and so on. Can the Taliban be induced to accept this? Well, that remains to be seen. But why did we get in Afghanistan in the first place? Geopolitics. Brzezinski, in 1978-79, as Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski argued that we should fund the opposition to the pro-Soviet regime in Afghanistan, which meant giving money, arms, and training to the Mujahideen, the, the same group which later became the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So the actual war in Afghanistan was not just 20 years, it goes back to 1979, when, as Brzezinski said, we lured the Soviets into invading Afghanistan. We wanted to make it their Vietnam. And I just wrote an article on this, which will be posted on my blog page, probably by Sunday or Monday, that goes through the details. But suffice it to say that why were we there? As the Obama and Bush coordinator of the Afghan war, Lieutenant General Douglas Lute asked, why were we there? 
We didn't know what we were doing, and that's from the military. From the geopolitical side, we knew exactly what we were doing. We used it to damage the Soviet Union and then to unleash Islamic fundamentalism in Russia and China. That's what the Uyghur separatist movement is. That's what we see in Chechnya. The whole idea of the Islamic card was Brzezinski's update of the great game to be the Ark of Crisis. And as long as we follow a doctrine such as that, we're going to be in war. Now, who believes in that today? Apparently, people like Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who are protégés of Madeleine Albright, who herself was a protégé of Brzezinski. If you look at the problem of American foreign policy over the last 50 years, it went from Kissinger as the Republican to Brzezinski as the Democrat, both of whom expressed their allegiance to British geopolitical ideas. Kissinger confessing at Chatham House, which is British intelligence in 1978, that he used British working papers for his documents when he was Secretary of State, and that he kept the British better brief than Nixon. And Brzezinski, who said his idea for the Ark of Crisis came from Halford Mackinder, the author of the Geopolitical Doctrine, because for both of them, quote, the prize was Eurasia, unquote. Now, Brzezinski influenced heavily Madeleine Albright, who was the major influence on Blinken and Sullivan and people like Susan Rice. Kissinger's ideas were all over the Republican Party. And so we see the two parties today in a bipartisan alliance for more war, for confrontation, for challenging Russia and China not to see who can do the best job of uplifting people around the world from poverty, but who can control the narrative, which side will be able to be the dominant one. And so we're leaving Afghanistan to do what? The pivot to Asia. This was Obama's policy. The idea that we have to confront China in the South China Sea and Russia in the Black Sea. These are war doctrines. These have nothing to do with the United States as a superpower. A superpower doesn't seek war. A superpower doesn't throw its, its military around and sacrifice its young men and women in endless wars. A good power works with other nations for the benefit of the others. And this was, to a large extent, what President Trump came into office professing that he intended to do. And that's why Luke Harding and Sir Richard Dearloff of MI6 and Christopher Steele of MI6 and uh, a number of other people, including Comey and Clapper and Brennan, deployed to carry out a regime change against Donald Trump because they wanted to avoid at all costs a potential for an, a collaborative relationship between the U.S. and Russia. So now we're out of Afghanistan. Where do we go from here? That's the issue. And I would encourage people to go to the SchillerInstitute.com website where you can pick up a copy of the latest uh, memo, strategic memo by Helga Zepp LaRouche, where she discusses this. And I'm going to find you the title in just a second here. Uh, Afghanistan at a Crossroads, Graveyard for Empires or Start of a New Era. Read that, think about it. I'll make sure my article is up on my blog page uh, by the end of the weekend. And make sure you discuss this with people. The idea of getting out of the war in Afghanistan should not be an excuse to get into a war with Russia or China, but can be an opportunity to break out from under the control of this British imperial doctrine which is designed to defend the primacy of the financial interests of the City of London and their junior partners on Wall Street and Silicon Valley. So thanks for joining me today. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you again on Monday.